Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Loving the Game. I'm Jacques, your host from Yellow Cap Sports. And um, today I've got a very, very cool guest with me, someone that's very inspirational, um, someone that I hope that can inspire you as he's inspired many, many people, even myself. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting him in person a few times. And um, yeah, it's it's been really a great time just to get to know um, my guest over the years um, as we both um, big passionate rugby supporters, big passionate bull supporters. And obviously we both support the Springboks. Let me not, let me not waste any more time Dan Lombard, how are you doing, my friend? Good, thank you to yourself, Jacques. Thanks for having me on the Yellow Cup Sports, Dan. No, it's only a pleasure. Um, Dan, uh, how's, lo how's lockdown been treating you? Oh, look, to be completely honest, it hasn't really been that bad. Um, you know, I'm at the moment I'm studying some counselling short certificate type vibes, so that's still continuing. Um, and then my my work that I do for the Bulls family obviously continuing as well in terms of, you know, the, the content I produce for them. So it's pretty much been same old, same old. I can't really complain. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Tell me then, um, I mean, you've briefly touched on it now that you, you um creating some content for for the, um, you know, the Bulls. Um, uh, what else? I mean, you also mentioned that you're studying. Um, just tell us at the moment in life, I mean, what, what are you, I mean, besides lockdown, under normal circumstances, what would you be busy with normally? Okay, so obviously, um, most people that are watching this uh, will know me as a rugby journalist, and that's where I kind of, that's the direction I took after I finished my honours at Tux in 2014. Um, it all started with the, with Pata Bay, the university's newspaper, and it just evolved to my blog, Rugby from a Wheelchair. And from there, I started getting opportunities with Supersport and the Bulls and Varsity Cup and all those all those people, um, organizations. And um, yeah, to be completely honest, I'm not really doing the sports journalism anymore. It was never really something I was going to do for the rest of my life. It was something I was good at. It was something I could get into immediately. Um, my passion has always been psychology and mental health. Uh, mostly to answer a question for myself in in the sense of, you know, a lot of people will ask me how I manage to stay so positive. And to be completely honest, I have no idea. It's been 12 years since, for the viewers that don't know, it's been 12 years since I broke my neck at Pretoria Boys at a practice match. Well, it was actually a captain's run. Um, we were supposed to play both got all the rain the next day and... Uh, I ended up breaking my neck in a ruck situation, freak accident. Um, and from there, it's just, you know, I've been fortunate enough to to survive that accident. There's not a lot of people that do survive such catastrophic spinal cord injuries. So I'm blessed in that sense. And then being involved in sport from my tux days all the way through, uh, especially with Game On magazine and stuff like that, it really brought some joy to my life. But like I said, it was never going to be something that I wanted to do. So in 2018, the big thing for me is 2018 and 2019 were very difficult years in terms of my health. I had to have a major operation in 2018 because my I suffer from what the spinal cord injury people call a spastic bladder, which basically means my bladder over time because because I have an indwelling catheter, my bladder doesn't um, expand and contract like a normal bladder. So it shrunk over time. And it, 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 the issue started from about 2015. And then it just got so bad, I was having to do Botox to paralyze my bladder. And it just got to a point where I had to do something to fix it. At one time, I was only able to hold 50 mils of, of liquid in my bladder before I would leak and stuff like that. So the next step was to do the operation which was very invasive. They took a piece of my colon and added it to my bladder because a bladder, just to give a biology lesson, a bladder expands and contracts, a colon doesn't. So now my bladder is able to hold 500 mils, which is better than 50 mils. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty cool in 2018. And I was in ICU for about a week which is, if you compare it to when I was in ICU for my rugby accident, 
I was only in ICU then for two days, which Whoa. the norm is two weeks. So that happened. And then 2019 in February, about a week after my birthday, um, I got septicemia in my bladder. There was a, an infection that went unchecked. And by the time it reared its ugly head, I was pretty much on death's door. My infection levels were like 500. The doctors told my parents that they don't think I'm going to make it. And unfortunately Whoa. for me, unfortunately for me, it just seems like I'm too stubborn to die. At the moment. I've got too <laughs> many things that I need to go to them. So let's, let's hope that long, that long, that carries long into the future because I've still got quite a few things I need to do on this earth before yeah. I pass on. Yeah, yeah. So Dan, I mean, thanks so much for telling us all that. It's really, really cool. I mean, you've answered almost half of my questions, but I'll, we'll still touch on it. I think there's a lot more detail we can get into and stuff. But let's go back to your childhood. Let's go back to your childhood days, if you don't mind. Um, where were you born, and where did your love for well, for rugby start, or or was there another love before rugby? Um, no. Well, look, I'll start it. Okay, so I was born in Joburg. I lived there with my mom because my biological father wasn't involved at all. Um, and then my adoptive father. So I was born O'Connell not Lombard. Um, and then my dad met my mom when I was about a year and a half. And uh, they got married um, and they moved down to Durban because my dad is from Durban, from Montclair Vibes, New Forest, you went to New Forest High School. Um, so we lived in Durban until the end of grade nine. Um, I started up until, the, up until grade six, I had always been in schools that didn't have rugby. The, the, winter, the main winter sport was soccer at, at the school that I went to. And in grade six, I went to a school called Chelsea Preparatory in Durban North. And they had rugby. So in grade six, I started. But when I started, um, I wouldn't say there was much passion. It was just a sport that I wanted to try. Um, I seemed to, be, to have some sort of um, ability in the game because... I started with the fourth or fifth team at Chelsea, which is, it's quite a feat for a primary school to have th four or five under 13 yeah. teams. But the one I was at, to had that. Um, about halfway through the season, I was asked to bench on this for the seconds. But when I sat there, huh, it's, it's, it's quite embarrassing to be, considering my personality now. But when I sat there <laughs> watching the, the play, only having, well, what, five or six games under my belt, I virtually knew nothing about the laws of rugby or anything. I was just playing the game as far as I could see it. Um, I was sitting there and I was watching the dudes and I was like, no, this is not for me. This is way too hectic. They're hitting each other hard. There's funny stuff going on in the rucks. So I, 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 sheepish, I sheepishly uh, basically slipped away and, and ran all the way home because I, I didn't want to be called on to... Um, but I think something changed throughout the season and I started realizing that rugby is a game that I can express myself in. I've always really played physical type games. Outside of rugby, I, I played the water polo in the summer. Um, I was pretty good at tennis, but I had to choose which one I wanted to focus on. So much to my mother's dismay, I decided to play rugby and, as opposed to tennis. Um, and yeah, I if I'm from about the third or fourth term of grade six going into the first term of grade seven, I started downloading the law books from the, the from the school library and started going through it and really trying to understand the game because rugby is not really a game you just pitch up and play. It's it's it, you have to have an understanding of the laws and you have to understand when and what you have to do. Yeah. Um, and from there it went on. Unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, just simply from a rugby perspective. Um, the school itself was fantastic, but I went to a Catholic school in Durban, grade eight and nine, St. Henry's Morris Brothers College. Uh, so my rugby trajectory took a bit of a dip. I mean, I, I made the under 14 A's and the under 15 A's, but we only had two teams. And then, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, representing the, the they call themselves the blue train at under 14, under 15 level was fantastic. One of the greatest memories I have from my rugby playing days is that my first try that I ever scored was against my dad's old school. Um, and it was a fantastic try. I mean, our, our center or our fullback broke through and I was in support 
because although I played generally lock, my opa always told me, don't play hard rugby, play smart rugby. Follow the ball and you'll be near the action all the time. So I was I was pretty I was a very loose lock. I didn't really play to that strength of, of you know hard hitting the rucks. I was basically a slower flank. Um, and yeah, the center fullback broke through, popped it off to me. I had a I only had their fullback. This was about on the twenty two meter line to get past. I decided I was probably gonna be easier for me just to run through him as opposed to trying to do this funny goose step thing. Um <laughs> And yeah, I managed to score my first try against my dad's old school. So that memory is, will live with me forever. And then I moved up to Pretoria um, for the start of grade 10. And I enrolled at Boys High, at Pretoria Boys. Um, and I quickly learned that the levels of a school like St. Henry's compared to a school like Pretoria Boys, where you go from a school that had two teams for each age group to a school that had eight teams per age group. Yeah, I quickly learned that I'm not the cream of the crop like I thought I was. So I was brought down to size very, very quickly. Um, yeah. started. I started out with the end of 16 D team. By the end of the season, I was playing for the C team. Um, and yeah, boys eyes where it, the love, the love really, really took hold because being at a school like that where they throw everything into their rugby. Yeah, it really makes you love the game more because you're in an environment. It, it, it's it's Basically, semi-professional. I mean, the gym programs we followed, the physios we had, et cetera, et cetera. It was semi-professional type vibes, which yeah. makes you really get you really get involved in the game. Then, obviously, you get the you get that bug in you get the bug in the bear to uh, to make the first team. Unfortunately, that dream didn't materialize before I broke my neck, but I did manage to play a few practice games at for the second team, the Black Shorts, as we're known as. Um, yeah, and then obviously I had my accident uh, in my matric year, and yeah, man, it's just gone from there. I don't want to say too much. We'll get, take that on another. Probably got other questions regarding that, so let's just end it there. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks so much. I mean, um, so you, um, like you said, you you were lock. Uh, were you a lock all along until your injury? Um, I played a season at number eight. Um, I could be used. I was I was pretty much like uh, Peter Stafford, so I played lock okay. or blindside wing. I do have a very fond memory of the only time I played against Greg Bloom, which was in Grade Ten. Uh, I played for the under sixteen D team, and then the under sixteen guy, uh, the C team. Uh, the backline got an injury, so I played one game at inside centre. But you know, okay. when you play your entire career, you play your entire career as a forward and you're close to the ball and you're close to the action, then having to stand there waiting for the ball as a backline player is just, I don't know how backline dudes do it. You just stand <laughs> there waiting for the ball the whole time. It's ridiculously, it's so frustrating. So I had one game at inside centre and I enjoyed it, but I, our captain on the day has to keep shouting at me to get out of the ruck. So, <laughs> That's great. Um, then, I mean, I know you've got a big love for Pretoria Boys. I am. Um, you always talk about them, even today still. And I mean, you've been out of school for a long time now. Um, tell us about the traditions of Pretoria Boys. Yeah, look, I mean, one of the things that I will forever be grateful and to my father is that he was the one who showed me the school. I was a bit apprehensive because I've been in college school my entire my entire yeah. schooling career. So I was a bit uh, apprehensive of going to an old boys school and. You know, all those things that are attached to it. But I must say, the moment I stepped in as a Form 3 at Boys High and I, you know, attending the... Because, I mean, when you when you arrive at Boys High and if you're, in, if you're in an older form, you still... You basically follow the orientation program that the grade 8s follow. Uh, you don't have to do everything, but you do most of it. And um, I realized from there, you know, the, the tradition, the respect... You know, the, the pride in the school, it was something I'd never experienced before. And having an institution like that where, you know, we were told from the get-go that we are at a school that is bigger than us, no matter what we achieve, there's people that will achieve more. There have been people that have achieved more. I mean, people will know guys like um, John Smith and Chili Boy and those people. I mean, Oscar Pistorius 
before all that all that drama happened. We we produced some really solid sporting stars. Chris Morris with the Proteas, um, Adrian Markham with the with the the Proteas. So we've we've got a lot of really good sportsmen. But the, what I love about Boys Eye and, and what I think is very special about Boys Eye is that the headmaster that I was under, Mr. Schroeder, he never wanted the school to be known for only one thing. And I think yeah. that is important. Um, Boys Eye has a huge emphasis, obviously, on the three traditional pillars of school. So education, culture, and sports. But there's also a fourth one that Boys Eye is very adamant. Well, at least when I was at the school. I'm not sure how it is now. I haven't been at school for 12 years. But um, when, I, when I was at school, we had a huge emphasis on pastoral care and the full holistic package that comes with education. It's not just about the amount of A's you get. It's not just about playing first team. It's it's a, um, it's not just about being in the choir and leading the Dixie band. It's about becoming an all-round person. It's why Boys Eye's motto is to see how we learn to live because we we get taught from a very young age that at Boys Eye that everything is works for a bigger picture. It works yes. towards a bigger picture. Um, so I'm forever grateful for having gone to a school like Boys Eye. But I mean, you the, the guys, the friends that I have, you get the same sort of thing if you go to a school like Uffies or Marisburg College or Great Bloom, Sachs, all those traditional old war, the, all those traditional boys' schools. They all share the same thing. It's why we're able to get along after school so well because, yeah, yes, we have a rivalry with Marisburg College or Uffies, but we all come from the same, we all cut basically from the same cloth. So we're able to understand, we know what our values are, what our, what our belief systems are, etc. So uh, I would have, be going to Boys R was an absolute, it was a privilege. And if I could, yeah. I would do it again. Just unfortunately, then, in grade eight. Yeah, yeah. That would have been good. Yeah. So then, I mean, yeah, 2008, that was unfortunately, uh, well, unfortunately, fortunately, because you're a very positive person. So it's hard for me to use the word unfortunately in, in, in your, you know, in, when I'm in your conversation. But I mean, 2008, yeah. that was the day or the year when you had your accident. And um, I mean, you briefly touched on it just now, but I mean, just can you, would you mind taking us through what happened that day? Not at all, not at all. Um, okay, so basically what happened, there's a whole long shot of, of things that happened. The easiest way to describe something, an injury like this is if, you, if, if some of the viewers have watched shows like Seconds from Disaster, where they take a situation or a scenario and they count all the little small things that add yeah. up because a disaster doesn't just happen out of thin air. There's a whole lead up to the big, the big explosion or the big whatever. So basically, yeah. the 13th of May 2008 was a Tuesday. Um, the Monday I decided to skip practice. I wanted to spend time with my girlfriend at the time. She went to uh, Macy's, the sister school of Afis. My dad always said, if you want to find a decent woman, date an Afrikaner woman, which is difficult because I could barely speak Afrikaans. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I basically decided to skip practice on the Monday. The Tuesday, I went to practice. Um, we were at our practice. At, at, at that time when I was at Boys R, the first, seconds, and thirds practiced as a, a large squad so that we all knew the calls and whatever, in case Oaks had to move up or down or whatever. It just makes it easier. And having to learn all new calls and whatever. Um, on the Tuesday, so my practice went off without a hitch, uh, the captain's run. And then after my practice, which ended at probably, I think, four o'clock, um, in the lead up to the next group of guys that were practicing, which would have been the fourths and fifths, they were known as the Marines back then, coached by Mac Craig McBride, absolute drill sergeant in terms of, uh, there's always, a common understanding that any team that McBride coaches will be the fittest team in the school. And that was the case in grade 11. I mean, we drop, if we dropped balls, we ran. If we made mistakes, we ran. And I think the one time we dropped 20 balls in one practice, I, we spent another two mm -hmm. hours running up and down stairs to learn sure. from our mistakes. Um, so we were fit. I mean, we, we were often used in my form four year, grade 11 year, the fourth and fifth were often used to run shadow against the first team because we could just keep up with them the whole time. It's also very 
it was a very great thing in Form 4 was that we I beat athletes twice in one day. I played for the fifths, we beat them 7-5. And then I was called up in within five minutes of the fourth team kickoff because the lock got injured. I was called into that game. And we ended up beating them 16-14 alone. Extremely hard game. Playing against athletes is not a fun thing uh, yeah. for, for the Soki. They're generally smaller, um, way smaller. Their backline could rival our locks. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, basically then everything... After that, when I was when I was thinking of what I was going to do after the second and third team practice had ended, I'd realized that I didn't really feel like doing homework. I felt a little bit guilty about not going to school, to the practice beforehand. I was fighting with my girlfriend, didn't want to talk to her. There were no buses. My mom, unfortunately, couldn't pick me up. She had other responsibilities with the other siblings that I have. So there was a whole lot of things that came up that, that just made me decide, you know what, let me go practice with the fourths and fifths again. And obviously McBride was happy enough to let me in. Um, because they had two full squads already, I basically was on the defense the whole time. And I was just there to make their lives a misery. And literally, no kidding you, Zach, probably, probably it was it was definitely the last movement of the, of the, of the practice. We had a sure. line-out scenario. We had a line-out scenario where I broke from the back of the lineup, tackled the scrum off, set myself up to steal the ball. And in that process, it is the only part I'm, I'm a bit hazy about, but in that process, my neck got stuck between his body and the ground. And when my forwards rucked over, obviously that, you know, rolling over uh, caused me to break my neck. And that's the scariest thing in the world to hear your, ne your neck break because it's right in your ear. And it was, well, funny enough, the first time I'd ever broken a bone. So my father's always maintained the fact that Dan goes big or, go, or goes home. So, so yeah, that, that's what happened. And uh, at least for me, that there was no pain um, because it's immediate. When you break your neck, you are instantly paralyzed. It's not a gradual process. You, you, just, you lose everything immediately. Um, this is literally the fastest second of your life. Uh, the only reason they knew something was wrong was because I was lying face to face with that scrum off I tackled. And you could see I was trying to scream, but nothing was coming out of my mouth. Wow. My mouth was just open and my eyes were just wide. Um, so, yeah, and then after that, you know, the, the, um, the ambulances came. They came to pick me up. I went to a little company of Mary, which is now known as Life Conclave. I was stabilized there, I was put into ICU. I had my operation the next day to fuse my neck because I broke my neck C4-5, vertebra C4 and 5. Um, in ICU for two days. The Thursday of that week, I was transported to Muirmed Medic Clinic, which is a private rehab, rehabilitation center in Pretoria. It's not too far from the union buildings. Um, and that's where I spent the next three months of my life, learning how to do certain things again. Um, yeah, I may because I think this is down to the fact that I, because I was pushing for the first team and I was so fit and looking after myself, eating right, going to the gym. Usually, guys who break their neck, T4, 5 will be in ICU for about two weeks. Uh, I was in ICU for, like I said, two days. I sat in my first wheelchair six days after I broke my neck. So, yeah. I recovered fairly quickly in the beginning. I still managed to stay the whole three months. Which is, which is the norm for somebody who breaks, your, breaks their neck at that level. Fortunately for me, my arms started coming back about a month and a half in. When I say arms, my biceps started coming back, uh, which just allows me now to at least move my hands a little bit. I can't use my hands. My fingers and wrists are still paralyzed, but at least I don't sit, you know, chock still because that would have been frustrating. I, I, I take my hat off to to people who have spinal cord injuries where they're completely paralyzed. It, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. It, it must be the most frustrating thing. So yeah, and after that, after I finished rehab, um, I went back to school and finished my matric. So you went back to Pretoria Boys? I went back to Pretoria Boys. Unfortunately, at that time, the school wasn't really wheelchair friendly and because 
because the school is seen as a national monument, because we're over 100 years old, it's very difficult to get changes implemented. I mean, it's easy enough to put in a ramp, but once you start changing building plans and stuff like that, it becomes a bit of a mission. So what, well, what they did is in, instead of me having to go from class to class, um, the classes I would be in the auditorium of the library and then my classes would come to me. It was an oh, easy wow. fix because it was an easy yeah, fix yeah. because I only had three or four months left of school. I think I was at school for a month when we started exams. So easy enough. But I was grateful the school did a lot of did a lot to allow me to come back. I mean they could have easily turned around and said it's too much work for us, you know, do your stuff from home. But they wanted me back. So That's I went, easy. I was in school uniform. Luckily I didn't have to wear the full uniform. I had to go I went to school in truck shoes and stuff like that, which was a bit easier for me. But yeah, yeah. the school did really went out of its way, especially in support of my family. My father especially, because this injury hits him really hard. It still does. And I think it's down to the fact that I got my passion for rugby from my father. The way I played, it was modeled on the way he played. Very hard man um, on the rugby field. And I remember watching him play for Glenwood Old Boys in Durban. And <laughs> club rugby is not a fun thing to play. And those, are, those men are hard as nails. Um, yeah. I learned a lot from him, so I think it hit him very hard. Um, he wasn't able to watch my last game, but luckily my mom was. So at least my dad, my dad had watched most of my games. I think pretty much all of them, if he wasn't away on business. Whereas my mom, because of the siblings and stuff, she didn't really get to watch too many of my games. But she was fortunate enough to watch my last one. Um, so yeah, that's what happened with the injury. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I saw the other day just. Um... Like, well, I think it was Monday. You posted something on your Facebook page, which which is very dear to you. And when I read it, I, I realized um, pro probably why, but I think you can obviously elaborate more on it. But three weeks after the accident, uh, you're welcome to obviously correct me, but three weeks after the accident, you, your dad, um, uh, well, Victoria Boys played against Afis. I'm not sure whether it was at Afis or whether it was at, at your school, but you were you went to the game. Um, I'm not sure if you were at the actual game or if you only got there afterwards, but you were there. It was three weeks afterwards, and you got what they called the office clap. And I remember when I read your post, um, you obviously didn't elaborate too much about it, but in it you mentioned there that apparently only two people outside of office have ever received that clap, and you were one of them. Just tell us about that. And also, what did it mean to you? Uh, so, so that day, um, one of the things when you break your neck like that, uh, or when you're in an accident where you become paralyzed, the therapists and the doctors want you to set goals for yourself. My goal was to go watch the first team play. Um, we were playing at Uffies that year. Um, and now that year, I think I think Uffies had several SA schools players. Half of that team was Craig Week, uh, was... Uh, Craven Week, uh, Bulls. Um, they were a strong team on paper. And so my, my mission was to get to the game. Uh, the doctors agreed to it as long as I was able to sit up long enough. They wanted me to be able to at least sit for two hours. Now, the, the, the average Joe who doesn't know about spinal cord injuries is that the inability to walk is the least of your worries. There are yeah. so many bigger factors. One of them being because my, because my ribs are paralyzed, I only breathe with 30% of my lungs. And sure. I breathe through my diaphragm. So when I first started learning how to breathe, and I basically had to learn to breathe and talk at the same time. When I first broke my neck, I started to look like Darth Vader, um, <laughs> having to breathe and talk. Um, so my goal was to sit up and to learn how to do it. Now, when you early on into your... Uh, into your spinal cord injury, what happens is your blood pressure obviously gets affected. We have very low blood pressure because we don't walk. And that means when you sit in a wheelchair, you become very faint, very lightheaded. You pass out a lot. So unfortunately, by the time the game came, uh, I wasn't, I didn't reach the two hour. I think I was sitting on an hour and 45. So the doctors decided, okay, it's enough. If something goes wrong, we'll just bring you back. Um, on the day, funny enough, I arrived about nine o'clock and I sat for seven hours straight without wow. passing out one. So wow. that's just because we were sucked up into the, 
I mean, boys, I played exponentially on the day. We we played fantastically. We Uffies, it, it was like we were at Boys Art. We couldn't hear Uffies cheering. The, the guys were so shocked um, on the field. Uffies team was just not there. They started to to claw their way back, probably with about ten or fifteen minutes left of the match. So we started getting worried about them, about that time. But before that, we couldn't hear Uffies. We couldn't see Uffies. Everything was Boys Art, and it wasn't just because of me. In yeah. 2008, we had a very bad year. We had a um, a father and three boys were killed in a car accident on the way back from a climbing. One of the boys uh, is, was a son of one of the teachers that boys are. So we had a very, very tough year in 2008 in terms of boys and injuries and deaths, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, so that everything, boys and I was just pumped up. We just, we wanted this. And we ended up winning the game. And beating off is that up is for the first time in 29 years. So sure. we had, and it was only last season that we managed to beat them again. So 11, uh, to, to 11 years after the, after we beat Afis, at Afis, we managed to beat them again at Boys Um sure. But yeah, that's the thing, man. So the Afis clap, I only came to realize, like I said, because we couldn't hear Afis, we didn't hear the clap on the day. But about three or four or five years after that. He's a Vim Mayer. He's a journalist for a network, a film people, I think. Um, he was the one who actually reached out to me and told me about the Afis clap and that I was only one of two outside of Afis to have ever received the clap, which was obviously fantastic for me. So, I mean, as much as boys, as much as Afis is our rivals on the field, the moment we leave the school, you know, there's a lot of brotherhood, at least from what I've seen. Um, you know, we, we put aside our differences once we're out of the school. And Afis has done a lot for me as well. I mean, with the sporting stuff, when I was doing, working for Game One, you know, setting up interviews with them and stuff, Afis has always gone out of their way to accommodate me. Uh, Dr. Edwards, um, you know, the headmaster during my time at, at, at Boys, he was the headmaster of Afis. He really went out of his way to help us um, in any way Afis could. So I have a lot of respect. As much as I love Boys, I have a lot of respect for Afis as well. That's brilliant. So, I mean, moving along, um, life after school, and there you are, you're paralyzed, you're quadriplegic. What was next for Dan after school? Oh, I should be back. Okay, so what was next after for me after the injury and after the trek? So basically, um, I'd never really given much thought to it because obviously I thought I had a lot more time to decide what I was going to do. Uh, obviously, with my accident, a lot of my options were taken off the table. I was pretty much, I was keen just to go to South America, farm potatoes and marry some Portuguese chick and have 10,000 babies. <laughs> that was pretty much my goal at that time, which was obviously put paid when I became paralyzed. So I enrolled at TAC straight after school. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, I'd missed the deadline, but they made some exceptions for me, considering my uh, issues that I had in matric. So I enrolled in TAC in 2009. I moved out of home as well. I moved into Corsace at TAC. Um, stayed there for four years. I actually haven't lived at home since I finished school. It's been it's, it's one of my pillars that I rely on, that I need to try and be a success on my own. So obviously my family is still very involved with me and they've, they've yeah. been the strongest support base I could ever ask for. Um, but it, for me, it was important because I had known from the get-go that once I leave home, once I leave school, I want to leave home. I want to go out, spread my wings. It's time to fly. The little bird needs to fly. Um, so yeah, and... In a nutshell, I started varsity and started in 2009 and managed to get my undergrad in, uh, in a BA general. Took a break or took a year off, tried to figure out what I was going to do next, and then did my honors at, in journalism in 2014. Um, okay, well, I mean, that's really, really cool. I mean, it just shows, as I mentioned earlier, on your positive attitude, and we'll get there just now because I first want to just go through what, um, you know, some of the stuff that I'm aware of that you did. Um, obviously, you mentioned about, you know, getting your 
your post grad and all that. But in 2012, you started your own website, um, sports blog called Rugby from a Wheelchair. That's actually where, I mean, that's the same year I started my website, the yellowcap.com. And um, I don't know what year exactly I got to know you, but when I got to know you, it was basically through rugby from a wheelchair. That was the common ground um, on which I basically found you and vice versa, whichever way you look at it. Um, we were both obviously passionate about rugby. We were writing about it. I mean, you were more focused on rugby where I was just doing sport in general, but obviously as rugby being my big, big passion, I mean, I obviously did a lot more in that, in that regard. Um, what made you, uh, obviously you, I mean, with studying journalism and that, that was obviously part of the reason why you then started your, your blog. Um, am I right? Um, yes and no. Uh, the, the studying journalism only came later. Basically oh, yeah, what yeah. I did was because I was trying to figure out, I was trying to join some sort of club or something at, at Touch just so I could get involved in the student life outside of being a, a, a house committee member and stuff like that which I was also the first quadriplegic in Tucker's history to be appointed as a house committee member for, oh. for, for Corsairs. Um, so I actually started the blog in the parking lot of my rehabilitation hospital, funny enough. Um, I just decided one day, that came off actually from the back of, up until that point, I, you know, I, I, I spoke on forums, I communicated on threads and stuff like that about rugby, spoke to my friends that were with me at that time, in Corsairs, yeah. etc. Um, and then one, some of them just kept saying to me, you know, Dan, you know a lot about rugby. Why don't you share your views? I said, okay, cool. And I decided to do it. And um, yeah, basically what I prided myself in is that although I gave an opinion, I always backed my opinion up with facts. So I think I did a piece on Heineken Mayer. I did a thing on Mornay Stain way back then when people were giving uh, Stain so much issues about his performances in the Springbok jersey, etc. And I backed it all in fact that people started to appreciate the fact that I'm not just giving my opinion as a rugby lover. I'm actually backing it up with fact that I'm bringing the stats in, etc. Yeah. That, set the, that set the ground for me to do my honours in journalism. And it's something yeah. I've always prided myself in is my integrity and the fact that I don't just write rumors. I don't just, you know, I don't just do things for clickbait and getting the views and stuff because a lot of damage can be done that way. Um, you know, especially nowadays with the advent of fake news and, you know, it's just, they will put out an article about a rugby player and use a, a particular headline. And when you actually read the body of the article, it's got nothing to do with the headline. Yes, which I feel yes. is for I feel as journalists, we are gatekeepers and we have a responsibility to be transparent with our readers all the time. If you don't know or if it's not confirmed, don't put pen to paper. It's as simple as that. You, you, I, don't, I don't agree with people who just put stuff out there just to get the views or just to get the likes. It's yeah, not, yeah. It doesn't, that's not what journalism is about. And whether you are some old chap, whether you Brendan Nell, <laughs> or Gavin Rich or guys like that, or you some random blogger who, who has, has an audience of five people, it doesn't matter. You, you are writing and you're putting your name out there, so you need to have integrity all the time. It's non-negotiable. Uh, people rely on your information. They rely on your facts. So the moment you let down the people, um, you, you, you should just step down as a journalist, the way I see it. Yeah. Just, go do something else. You can't do that. So yeah, so from there, so basically where it started, so I joined Padre Bay, like I said, I wanted to join a club. Our Padre Bay is the University of Pretoria's newspaper. Uh, the longest running newspaper, it's not the oldest, but it's the longest consecutively running newspaper in Tux, uh, in, in South Africa. Um, I was fortunate in the year I was, I was there, uh, it was part of the 75th anniversary. So I managed to get into the little book that they had. I did a piece actually on tax and the way back then. I mean, everybody remembers how tax was always getting into trouble for posting ineligible players and whatever. So I did a huge article on that. I interviewed guys like Tank Lanning and um, Rob Lowe and stuff like that about their thoughts on it. And I actually <laughs> dragged tax a little bit through the dirt, but I've always been 
somebody like that. It's, I don't care if I'm writing for an institution's newspaper. If you're screwing around, I'm gonna I'm gonna call you out on it. Um, and that's about it. So I managed to cover. I worked very closely with uh, Coach Nonis Murray when he won back-to-back -back titles 2012-2013. Then I managed to cover them again in 2017, but through Varsity Cup. And uh, I think it was Coach Butter at that time when he won Varsity Cup in 2017. And that's obviously a joy. It's always a good thing when, I mean, all of Texas finals we've beaten Marty's, which is always great for us. So, yeah, but... Uh, I loved it. I mean, I worked for Varsity Cup as well for about five years, covered tasks. I've really enjoyed covering rugby and working in rugby. So that's yeah. where I started. Unfortunately, in about, I think, February 2016, I think it was, yeah, rugby from a wheelchair just became too much. It was, yeah. I wasn't getting paid for it, and there was no financial income from that. So I had to let that go. I mean, rugby from a wheelchair is still available. You can still go through and read stuff. Because there was a reason why I called it rugby from a wheelchair. Because it wasn't just rugby. It was also issues relating to spinal cord injuries. Yeah, yeah. Wheelchair. So, yeah, then, so, um, so yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, actually, when I was looking up information about you and just going through your history and stuff, um, I mean, I know you're part of, you know, the, like, as you call it, the Bulls family. And you write a lot of articles for them. You've been actively involved, obviously, over the last while, um, you know, with all the new signings and stuff. But, I mean, you actually write for what was called back then the Blow magazine, um, which was the Bulls' own magazine, which they bought out, I think, monthly or whenever. I can't remember now. But, I mean, you started writing for them in 2013 already. So you've been, you've actually been with the Bulls for it's now basically seven years. Um, I mean, how did that opportunity come about? Um, I was irritatingly persistent. Um, <laughs> back in 2013, when the blow had a bulls babe, a Vodacom bulls babe that had a, um, a column that she wrote in every month or every issue that came out. And she was friends with my girlfriend at that time. So she asked my girlfriend if I would be interested. And I then managed to meet the media communications and marketing manager, Shanil. He wanted to meet me after, or during the interview or after the interview. And I um, basically just said to him, you know, bro, I, I really want to, I want to run for the Bulls. The Bulls is my life. I love the Bulls. And I've, I've tried to get hold of you. I was actually emailing to the wrong email address. So that's why he, I wasn't getting through to him. But he saw something in me and gave me an opportunity. And I started writing. Uh, in the beginning, it was an article here, an article there. Um, and then when Blow uh, shut down, Camille wanted to keep me on board in various capacities. And my role has grown from there. And I'm now, I'm now a content, uh, a content creator in, in the written format. So I do a lot of writings for the Bulls, and I love it. I love, the Bulls family is everything to me. I, I, it's, you know, I've, I've always been part of the – before we came up – before the, the hashtag Bulls family became a thing, I was, or I've always seen the Bulls as, as, as family. Um, they've always had a place in their heart for me. They've never, ever, ever, not once, seen me as somebody who's disabled. Um, my – Work ethic has proven to them that it's almost they don't see me as disabled at all. So the expectations yeah. on me is exactly the same for any other able-bodied person, which is how it should be. I don't deserve special treatment. I've learned from the beginning to play open cards. So if I have to go to hospital where I can't cover a match because I'm not feeling well or whatever, um, I would I just play open cards. And because of that, our relationship has really blossomed and become so fruitful. I, I can't say enough good things about the Bulls. Whether whatever happens on the field, the Bulls will always be family, and they'll always be number one for me. Yeah. Um, something I saw was in back in 2015, and I don't know if you know what it would be now, because it's five years later. But in I, I read an article where you could um. Oh, before I say what what I want to say is just for those that don't know. 
um, and thinking now, I mean, but how do you write? Um, it's, it's a very interesting thing that Dan actually writes with his tongue. Um, you do everything, well, not everything, but I mean, most of your, well, all your writing you do with your tongue. And um, I think it's on your phone, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, you, you use your phone, which, um, which you use. But back in 2015, you could write 900 words in 15 minutes. Have you, have you, do you still keep up to date as to if that has changed, if it's faster now? Do you still check the clock? Uh, no. The reason actually why that came about is actually got to do with Supersport because I used to write match reports for Curry Cup and Supersport Rugby Challenge and Vodacom Cup before it became defunct. Um, and Supersport wants their articles. <laughs> like a second after the game is done. So you have yeah. to write quickly and you have to write no mistakes. You have to get the scorers right. You have to spell their names right. You have to get their position. Everything has to be tip top for super sport because I mean, they are the number one sports broadcaster in Africa, at least. So yeah, super sport, they have very high standards and that's where it came from. I had to type fast for super sport and not make mistakes. So that's where it comes from. I haven't really done it because I don't really work in sports journalism anymore. I don't really check on things like that. Yeah, it's yeah. About the same. I mean, people, a lot of people will get uh, as soon as because if, especially if people talk to me over WhatsApp first before meeting me, then one of their first statements is, "How do you type so fast?" Look, I am assisted with dictionary. I mean, it does. I mean, and my phone learns the way I talk. So if I if I write, for instance, Warwick or Jesse. It's automatically going to fill in Kalant or Creole because I've okay. written so much of them. So my phone has adapted to my needs. I mean, I can, if I'm typing out, let's say, a Bulls team list, for instance, I can go 15 full stop and then pretty much dictionary will fill in the rest of the team if it hasn't changed wow. from the week before. So my phone has learned the AI and stuff. So hopefully, um, hopefully the. Skynet it never happens and Terminators never come because my phone will my phone knows me <laughs> better than I do probably. So <laughs> yeah, that's where it came from. Man. And the reason I use my tongue is I mean when I was studying at Tux and stuff, I had voice recognition technology and I had all that stuff um, that I could use. But I like to be out in the sun. I mean one of the things that you'll notice about me when you meet me is whether it's winter or summer, I always have a full year tan. My tan never goes away unless I'm stuck in a hospital bed. And that's because I just like to be in this. The sun makes me happy. And this is why working in rugby is so great because you're on the side of the field in the sun, especially in Victoria. I mean, it, it is a bit chilly, but at least we've got really decent winter weather. You know, the sun is always out. And just yeah, like yeah. that. So I want to be more mobile. So using a phone is how I can do that. And because phones are big, I mean, when I first broke my neck, it didn't really have touchscreen phones. Yeah, so yeah. In the beginning, I had to type with phones. I had to use styluses and stuff like that. And as the phones got better, I mean, an interesting fact is in 2014, when I passed my honors at Tux, I never opened a laptop. I did everything on my phone. Everything. Wow. Mm -hmm. And back then, I was using an S3 or an S4. So it's not even the type of phones we have now. Yeah, so yeah. Been like from the beginning. So I've got all these wonderful apps that help me to do my work and I can cut things and change formats and do a lot of stuff on my phone. I should actually, yeah. I should actually chat to Samsung and uh, talk about becoming an ambassador. So I use oh, their yeah, phones sure. way more than most people do. Huh. No, definitely. I agree. It's funny that you aren't one yet already. I mean, it's, um, it's really, I mean, something that they should embrace and be proud of um, because I know that's, I mean, you, you use, that's basically what you use, the Samsung. Um, yeah. But anyway, perhaps if you don't mind telling us about Tiger Stripes, yeah. please. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to condense it down a bit and not go down. So, so basically, Tiger Stripes was for the name Tiger Stripes comes is twofold. There's there's two reasons for that name. Because if you think of Tiger Stripes Revolution, you won't think it's the, it's not necessarily a mental health company or organization. Um, yeah, it comes from two things. One, my father has nicknames for all his children. And mine was always Tiger, mostly because of the way I played. <laughs> and then my my step my step uh, brother, 
through my dad's new marriage, was a, a very avid mountain biker at school. I mean, he still is now that he's studying in Belgium. You know, he's, he's able to cycle in, in forests like the Somme, etc. Um, very beautiful area. But when, yeah. uh, when he was still at school, they went down to the coast. I think it was Fort Elizabeth for a race that was part of that Spur mountain bike school series thing. Yes. And when they went to a pub to have some pub lunch on one of the days. They found, they saw a poem on the wall called Entitled Tiger Straps. And one of the lines in there is, in the fiery ferocity, my tiger straps are earned. And from that, it's actually a, the poem is actually tattooed on my right, yeah, right by uh, right peck. Um, very, very. The poem means a lot to me, and um, it started because I knew that sports journalism wasn't something I wanted to do in forever. I was always passionate uh, about psychology and mental health. The mind fascinates me. The mind over matter, and the people achieving when people tell them they can't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera always been something that fascinates me i actually started studying psychology uh, that's what my undergrad was in but at that time i was too young and too immature and i hadn't lo- collected enough life lessons yet to feel that i was adequate enough to, to talk to other people about mental health uh, it's a different yeah. story now 12 years down the line i've learned a lot and this is why my accident is a blessing you know people get all People will look at me with weird looks when I tell them that my accident's a blessing. It's a blessing in the sense that I was forced to grow very quickly. Very, very quickly. I, I, I wasn't afforded the same leeway that other 21-year-olds or 22-year-olds had, you know? Yeah. Um, I had to look after my health, which was, you know, when you're 21 years old, you don't want to have to worry about catheters and pressure relief that make yeah, sure yeah. you're on people bladder infections, etc. You don't want to worry about those things. So it was a big, it was a steep learning curve. But mentally, I've never struggled with my accident. Um, my father is a, a firm believer of the notion, control what you can control. I can't control breaking my neck. I can't control becoming paralyzed. So what is the point of sitting there and thinking about that? You're wasting your time. Well, I was wasting my time doing this from the very beginning. I mean, I think two weeks after I broke my neck, I told my dad straight. I was like, Dad, I'm going back to school as soon as I'm out of this hospital. He was like, no, Dan, you know, take it easy. You can finish school next year. He's like, no, Dad. For 12 years, the the target was 2008 is when I'm going to leave school. I'm not friends with the Oaks in Form 4. My girlfriend is in matric. I want to go to my matric dance with her. I want to finish school with her, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I went back and that's been my thing is that I will not allow my disability to affect that trajectory of my life. If yeah. I have goals and dreams, then I will do it. Most often, most often I have to find different ways to do it, which again is a blessing because I don't follow life the same as every other average Joe. I have to come up with my own ways, my own means. Um, yeah, so that's basically where Tiger Stripes comes from. The fact that I want to help people because it's not anybody can do it. Like yeah. a lot of people are afraid. Dealing with your emotions and dealing with your mental health is a very scary thing. Um, so you need a guide. So basically, people can look at me as a as a as a sharper for as a sharper for for climbing up the mental health mountain because I've been there, done that. I've sat with my demons. I've looked inwards. It's it's not fun, but I am the man I am today because I've done it. Yeah. And the sooner you do it, the easier it becomes, honestly. And most people only really start doing this when they're very far into their adult years. And by then, it's yeah. a little bit too late. It's a little bit too late. You've got to start this early on. In fact, they should start it at school level already. You should have subjects that deal with these things because mental health is everything. Dan, um, am I right in saying you an ambassador, or do they call it something else for the uh, Chris, De, Chris Berger, Petra Jackson um, Players Fund? Or how are you involved? Okay, so I'm not an ambassador per se. I am a recipient because I hurt myself on the rugby field. The Players Fund 
who as well have done exponential work. You know, they look after anybody who's catastrophically injured, and that's not just guys who end up in wheelchairs. Yeah, that's guys. That's rugby players who've, um, you know, had traumatic brain injuries and stuff like that as well. Um, and uh, there's 107 of us on the fund at the moment, uh, and they do a lot of hard, a lot of hard yards to raise funds to look after us. Um, you know, to make our lives a little bit easier, to help yeah. us buy equipment and all that jazz. So I'm not an ambassador. I do write yeah. for the players from time to time because I'm I'm genuinely good in front of the camera and I'm able to speak off the cuff and not make mistakes. The Players Fund has used me from time to time. I mean, one of my favorite memories was the banquet with the Springboks. I think it was 2016 or maybe the end of 2015 when Australia came to play us. We, I got to interview Stephen Moore and, and those guys on stay a client. Uh, Dane Halepetti, and there was another dude as well that was on the stage. And I got to interview them live, but it was covered by Super Sport, which was really, yeah. really cool. Um, so the Players Fund has given me a lot of opportunity uh, to be part of, of the rugby community in a different sense. Um, yeah, so that's what I do with the Players Fund. They do a lot more for me than I do for them, that's for sure. That's really cool. Dan, what does I... Finish off with. I mean, what is what are your future plans? So it's mostly got to do with counselling. Um, I've got to finish my higher certificate this year, and then I need to redo my some of my subjects from Baltimore so that I can get my honours in B Psych. And once that's done, I'm able to then become a registered counsellor. Uh, at the moment, I do do stuff like peer support at my hospital and stuff. So that it's mostly studying at the moment, to be honest, because I kind of left that late and uh, the train left the station quite late with that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I'm back now. I was, it's actually quite funny. Um, when I started, because I started studying now at the beginning of January and I walked into my class and I'm the oldest by far. I think about 80% of the class only finished high school last year. So wow. I'm seen as... I'm, I'm seen as the older dude. I think my one of my lecturers last year, for last term was only five years older than me. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've kind of left the station later with that, but to be completely honest, I prefer it that way because I feel I'm in a much better situation to help yeah. people. And, you know, if people need to chat and stuff like that, you can follow Tiger Stripes on Facebook. Uh, it's Tiger Stripes Revolution on Facebook, on Instagram. You can send me an email, go to my website, tigerstrops.coza. Send me an email at dan at tigerstrops.coza. My passion is to help people through traumatic experiences. Because at the end of the day, the only way you can move past the traumatic experiences is if you accept change. Because you've undergone change and you have to realize that. Mm. So yeah, that's my plans. Dan, it's been an honor to speak to you. Um, it's been a privilege to have your time. I know you're a very busy man, and uh, I think this is the longest I've ever been able to speak to you. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And um, being able to get to know you on a, on a bit of a different level. Um, and I, I, I look forward to days after the lockdown where, where we can meet up face to face. I know we've been talking about it a lot in, in years gone by. And, you know, I think with lockdown and everything, a lot has changed and a lot has to change in the world and people need to start um, doing and stop talking if you know if that's a matter of speaking and um, one of those things is definitely i think we need to stop talking about it and start doing it and get get my butt over to pretoria and um whether i come and watch a game with you that would be actually the best to do <laughs> and then you okay. can see then you can, then you at least can see my side of being a bull supporter, and um, yeah, I'd like to spend time with you. And it's been really, really awesome to get to know your story, um, which is something I haven't had the honor of really doing. And you know, um, I hope that someone watches this and gets inspired in some way or another, um, or maybe even get in touch with you. And, I, and I'll definitely make a plan of it and putting your details down wherever I can, um, as you've mentioned just now. As I said, thanks for your time, Dan. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, we've, we've got to get that Stereo Stumpy date out the way, bro. We've been talking about that thing <laughs> since 2017. 
So, yeah. But yeah, Doug, thanks so much for uh, having me on the stay on on the show. Um, thank you for being so understanding. And so we were supposed to do this like two months ago already. Hence, number, <laughs> episode number one is after episode number fifty. Um, but I do appreciate you having me on the show and being able to speak about not just rugby, the Tiger Stripes and stuff like that. So we do appreciate it. I just want to say one more word before we leave is that the fundraising yeah. arm of Tiger Stripes is, is underway. It is called Mind Warriors, which is uh, between myself and a fellow uh, rugby quad uh, by the name of Harald Swartz. We will be doing the 94.7 cycle challenge. He'll be doing it by a hand cycle. I've got a friend, uh, a, good, a good friend's husband, Andrew, would be pulling me in a chariot. We're going to raise, our aim is to raise 100,000 rand uh, with the funds going, being split between the players fund and my organization that helps spinal cord injured people who want to get back into the working life and whatever. We've ra- managed to raise about 16,000 rand, so we're, we're quite far off the, the target. So if anybody would like to donate, please go check on Facebook. Mind Warriors SA, go check on Instagram, the links are there. Please, do, if you can donate, please do. It goes to great organizations. Um, we, like I said, we've already raised 16,000 rand. The, the funds from the funds that go to Tiger Stripes from that amount has been used to to purchase masks and stuff that can be donated to spinal cord injured SCR rehabs and welfare organizations. So the money is being used for very important things at the moment. So please, if you can support us, please do. I'll definitely share that um, and make sure people get the message. And hopefully, you guys can reach more than you than more than your goal because that is ultimately for a good cause. Anyway, Dan, have a nice evening, my friend. Stay well, stay safe, look after yourself. And one of these days, the Bulls are winning again, as we all know. Um, no doubt about that, and no need for anybody that's um, a, not, a non-Bull supporter to argue about that either. Like at the end of the day, Super Rugby t- the Super Rugby titles have always had a home at Loftus, and I've, I've got a feeling a few more of them are going to be coming down the line. So big things happening at the Bulls, special things happening. Um, we've got uh, we've got a world class coach, we've got world class players. So now we need to go out and get that trophy back because it's, we've missed it. We need that yeah. trophy back in the world. Have a nice evening, my friend. You too, brother. Keep well, man.